Welcome to the CTDL Support Services Terms Proposal Webinar. We appreciate all of you joining us today for um, this webinar. And today I am joined by Nate Argo, Associate Solutions Architect, Phil Barker, CTDL Consultant to Credential Engine with Cetus LLP, and I am Jeannie Kitchens, Chief Technology Services Officer with Credential Engine. We may also be joined by other Credential Engine colleagues, and I know we're joined by our colleague, uh, colleague Cadence Colexto, who will be um, pasting links in the chat for you. Thank you for doing that, Cadence. We will, um, we'll, we are recording uh, this webinar and following this afternoon's webinar, an email will go out to all registered participants. It will include all materials that we will cover um, during this webinar, as well as the recording. And today we're going to cover the topics of the CTDL update process, an overview of the support services task group, a review of the CTDL support services proposal, and that includes a review of domain models and triple diagrams, and no worries if you've never heard those words before. Nate Argo is going to present those, and he's very good at, uh, at doing that, so you will understand it after today's webinar. The terms proposal will be presented by Phil Barker, and then I'll talk a little bit about a credential registry minimum data proposal, and then how all of you can provide feedback and our next steps um, with moving forward with the CTDL terms. And just to kind of set the stage for those of you who may not be all that familiar with Credential Engine, we are a nonprofit. We have a mission of credential transparency and we do that through programs and through technologies. And today's webinar is going to focus on one of our technologies, and that's a credential transparency description language. But it's also important to know that the CTDL, or Credential Transparency Description Language, is foundational to all of our work at Credential Engine. <clears throat> all of the tools that we provide, all of the programs that we offer at Credential Engine are about the CTDL and the CTDL publishing tools that Credential Engine manages and provides open access to all use the CTDL. And then the data published to the Credential Registry is CTDL published as linked open data. And finally, that data in the Credential Registry is intended for others to use with their applications for their users based on their use cases. So this is the big picture of the tech CTDL and how it fits into our other technologies and how others can use it. <clears throat> Today, when we're talking about our CTDL terms proposal, we're talking about growing the CTDL. The CTDL is composed of three schemas, the Credential Transparency Description Language, the CTDL ASN, which is about competency data, and quantitative data, which is about aggregate outcome data. And you can see on the right, the picture shows the breadth of the CTDL. Each of the circles and the names next to the circle represent the classes or entities in the CTDL. The arrows are notional, but they're meant to communicate how all the data can be linked together to tell rich stories about credentials and data adjacent, adjacent to credentials, including support services. So we'll actually be updating this diagram to include support services with it. <clears throat> also fundamental to our presentation today is to understand a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, about the CTDL update process. Um, when we update the CTDL, we are following policies. We have a significant managed specifications um, policy that um, <clears throat> we follow. And the task group that we're going to talk about in the resultant terms proposal follow that policy. We also have a namespace policy. And you could see here in this diagram showing the relationship between Credential Engine, the CTDL team, which includes Phil, Nate, myself, and others, and how we interact with external groups in order to develop the CTDL. So we can see in the bottom right, there are CTDL task groups, and the most recent task group was the support services task group. 
And at the top of the right here, we can see the CTDL advisory group, um, which is an international group that anyone is welcome to join. And then we can see to the left of this, of that, um, this blue box here, that um, staff and other advisory groups <clears throat> are also interacting with, the, with us and the CTDL team. <clears throat> so this is a real high level overview of the update process for updating the CTDL. When we convene a, a task group, it is a group of subject matter experts. We meet over approximately a three month period. Um, and then following the task group, we hold public webinars, and that is what we're doing now. We held one earlier today. This is the second of the two public webinars, and this webinar will be followed by a two-week comment period. And what's really important about the processes that we follow is they ensure orderly changes that support durable and persistent value to the CTDL. So um, <clears throat> you'll see more information in just a moment about the support services task group and how we followed this process. <clears throat> when we convene a task group, we anticipate approximately six meetings, although with support services task group, we held seven. Typically it's over a three month period and there's always consensus on a charter and a plan. So that always comes first. Then once the task group has accepted the charter and plan, we move on to identifying use cases, gathering real world examples, and then the real hard work begins with the CTDL team where we begin to iterate on the models and diagrams that Nate's gonna show you, the terms proposal that Phil is gonna show you, the minimum data policy that I am going to show you, and all along the way we're developing consensus on going forward. <clears throat> this listing here gives you an idea of how we structure the six meetings for a task group. And what you'll see in here is there's a lot of iteration. So what we're doing is allowing enough time, two weeks between meetings, where the CTDL is behind, um, team is behind the scenes, working on um, <clears throat> solutions for the use cases and the real world examples, iterating back to the task group to get feedback and improving throughout the process. So let me give you a short overview of the support services task group, and then we're going to take a deeper look into the outcomes from that task group and ask for your feedback following this webinar. <clears throat> so the support services task group members, I'll show you a listing of them, and this list that you see here of outcomes are, are typical outcomes with any task group. In this particular case, all of these outcomes are specific to the support services task group that included the charter, the use cases, uh, the models, the proposal, and the minim minimum data policy. <clears throat> uh, you can see that we had a, um, a very good representation. We had a rather large um, task group, and you could see by the names in the organizations here that they represented a lot of different perspectives about support services. So it was really great. We had a lot of active participation. If we have members of the support services task group um, in this webinar, I want to thank them um, for participating. And they should uh, put a note in the chat letting you all know um, that they're participating this afternoon as well. Um, we could not get this work done without these task groups and without their active participation. <clears throat> so as I said, the first um, thing that we do is we write a charter and we get feedback on the charter from the task group. So this particular charter was accepted and it was accepted only after getting feedback and making updates to it. So it's a really great process um, that involves a task group in the very first meeting. Um, and this is what the task group did. They focused on data that includes learner and earner supports to enter into, navigate, and complete informal and formal education to career pathways. And then the information below that, you can see that the group was concerned with making sure that as we worked on the support services proposal, it wasn't solely geared to students in formal education programs. Of course, we wanna make sure that that is represented 
but we also want to go broader. We want to make sure that if there's support services available to um, earners or workers, as well as others, whether they're um, formally affiliated with a program or not, that there's that we could design as a way so those support services could be described. And you could take, if you're interested, you're welcome to take a look at the charter that was accepted. <clears throat> so after working on the charter, we began developing use cases and all the members of the task group participated by actively contributing use cases. We also built off use cases that were developed by the Credential Engine um, Equity Council and the Credential Engine um, Licensure uh, occupational licensure advisory group. So you saw in the prior slide with the diagram of how we interact that other advisory groups are inputs into our processes. So we started with those use cases, the um, support services task group then augmented those use cases. And you can see in the screenshot here that what we did was an analysis of the use cases. We did things like assign actors, identify themes, we also identified if there were existing CTDL terms that may cover those use cases and where the potential CTDL coverage gaps were. And that's where our proposal comes in. We want to make sure that we can support some of uh, the real world use cases as well as some aspirational use cases as well represented by these use cases. And you're welcome to take a look at those use cases if you're interested. <clears throat> so um, the use cases were uh, and charter were foundational to the next section of the outputs from the C from the support services task group. So in just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Nate to talk about the domain model and triple diagrams. Then Phil will take over with the terms proposal, and then he'll pop it back over to me, and I'll talk about the minimum data proposal. And I'm going to go ahead and give the screen share to Nate. All right, one second here. Well, Nate's getting geared up there. Feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. Okay, I think everything. You should be able to see my screen now. We do. Okay, uh, so this is the updated domain model. Um, going to take a high level view of it and we'll zoom into the pieces of it here uh, just to start out with everything that's in gray or has kind of these plain black arrows here this is all existing stuff so a number of existing classes in ctdl a number of existing properties in ctdl uh, things we already have that we're, we're leveraging as part of this work uh, there are some orange arrows here these are cases where we have an existing property that we're extending the uh, the usage of to make it more useful uh, for this situation. But mostly what we're going to focus on are the items in blue. So you notice that there is one box in blue. This represents the support service class, which is kind of the container uh, for, for the list of properties in here. Um, all the properties that are in this box are existing properties, but there are some new properties along these arrows that connect this class to other things in CTDL. Um, so I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. So the support service class uh, has a number of properties coming off of it that connect to other things. Uh, we'll take a look at these. We'll start with the has support service arrow here. So has support service also shows up down here. And the purpose of that is to say that this object, whether it's a support service or one of the things down here, has a support service attached to it. Now the reason that it's in both places is to enable describing support services at multiple levels of detail and multiple levels of granularity. So if you want to have, say, one support service that kind of covers everything that you do, you would just have that. If you want to have a support service that has kind of a hierarchy of other support services hanging off of it, maybe to sort of mirror the structure that's on your website or something similar to that, uh, you can do that as well. So you can have a general support service that describes everything and then go down into more levels of detail for, for more specific services. Um, Part of the reason you might want to do that is if some of those services have particular conditions tied to them. So you notice this connection out here to support service condition, uh, which points to condition profile. So in CTDL, condition profile is a class that we use to describe, uh, as the name implies, a set of conditions, constraints, uh, requirements, things like that, to basically say that in this case, this set of support services applies to this particular audience, this particular level of audience, uh, this particular type of residency. There are a bunch of other properties in condition profile for things like uh, cost, location, uh, ties to other uh, other objects in CDDL and so on. So this allows you to, to 
say that it's a support service, but you have to meet certain requirements in order to access that service. Um, coming up here, we have the two uh, properties, support service type and accommodation type. So these, again, as the name implies, are types of accommodations or types of supports that are attached to that service. You'll notice both of those arrows, as well as several of these other arrows, all point to concept. Uh, the way that we use concepts um, is uh, as an item in a controlled vocabulary. Those are in what we call a concept scheme, which would represent the vocabulary itself. Uh, Phil is going to go into more detail on this here in a bit. Uh, but for now, uh, suffice it to say that all of these things that are pointed to concept are basically using these various controlled vocabularies um, as a way of making the data more interoperable. So I'm going to come down here. Uh, you'll notice that the has support service arrow uh, shows up down here as well, which allows things like credentials, uh, learning opportunities, assessments, uh, collections, jobs, and so on to link to support services. There is another property on here, um, support service four, which allows the support service to point out at all of these things. Uh, the reason that both of those arrows exist uh, is to enable the connections to flow either way, uh, which helps out whenever you're publishing data. So maybe you are uh, a third party provider of, and, and the only thing you provide is the support service, but you wanna indicate that your service is attached to say a credential or, or to uh, a job or something to that effect. You're able to publish the service data, point out to that thing, um, and go from there. Uh, the, the inverse of that would be that maybe you're the publisher of the credential data, maybe you're the publisher of the course, the assessment, and so on, um, and you want to indicate that for this assessment, for this credential, and so on, uh, here we have a support service, and you want to point to it from your credential, from your assessment. So that, that set of connections goes in both directions. One thing I want to highlight down here, and we'll go into more detail on this here in a bit, is this connection to scheduled offering. So you'll notice that all of these things uh, that are attached as sort of the requirements for earning a credential, uh, so courses, programs, assessments, things like that, uh, one of the ways that you can get data about those is through scheduled offering. The purpose of the scheduled offering class is to indicate uh, when something is specifically available. So maybe you have a course that is offered um, in two different ways. Maybe one is a like a, a nighttime weekend course, and maybe that same course is also offered uh, in the daytime on weekdays, um, various other uh, Details like that can all be expressed through scheduled offering, and if a particular offering has services and other offerings don't, again, you can connect those services to that scheduled offering to get you that level of detail. And we'll take another look at that here in a second. Uh, before I move on to that, are there any questions on any of this? Give a second here. I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to keep moving. So here we have uh, the first of the two triple diagrams that we're going to look at. And the reason they're called triple diagrams is that uh, all of the stuff we built in CTDL is based on what's on the resource description framework, or RDF for short, which is a way of organizing data. Phil could tell you a lot more about it than I could. Mm -hmm. The relevant portion of it here is that the way it represents data is to uh, call things resources and connect those things with these arrows that are called predicates. So you have, uh, and, and if you want to follow kind of a grammatical structure, a resource can be a subject, it can be an object in a sentence. So you have your subject, the organization offers your predicate, the object is this support service, for example. Um, and then the support service takes the subject role in another triple that says this support service is available at this place, which is your object of this one. So you have these kind of two objects connected by a predicate thing. That's, that's where the subject predicate object structure comes in, aka the RDF triple. Anyway, for this one, uh, this is very loosely based on uh, services that SNHU offers. They offer a lot more than this. We just captured enough here to kind of give you an idea of how this structure works. So here we've got three different support service uh, instances of the support service class captured in the data. Uh, here we have the first one that is very general, just saying SNHU offers this support service, which has uh, academic guidance, immigration service, transportation <laughs> service, and legal service. That is very general. It's offered at the organization level. There's no particular requirements or anything uh, tied to that in this, uh, in this modeling here. They offer a second one, which has a number of accommodations and services tied to it, but it's only available on their main campus here. They offer a third one, which has a number of support services tied to it, but it's available at the Shapiro Library. So this is just to give you a, a very lightweight example of how the support service can not only describe the information, but then further contextualize it by linking out to other things. And we're going to take a look at a more uh, more complex example here in a moment. But are there any questions on this one? I'm not seeing any. 
Okay, feel free to chime in if you come up with any questions. Uh, so this next example, I'm going to come over here where we can get a better look at it. Uh, so there's a lot going on here, but we'll go through it uh, step by step. So this shows, the intent of this diagram is to show several instances of the support service class, which are these kind of light red colored ones here, um, being used in different contexts to convey different pieces of information. So we're going to start up here at the upper left corner. Uh, so here we have the organization, which is in this case just a sort of generic college that offers a support service um, called academic advising. And they offer it to future members and current students. Uh, they would probably also offer it to, to future students. That is one of the terms we've added to our vocabulary since then. And again, Phil will go over that in more detail here in a bit. Um, so this is a very simple example, just showing a support service uh, that has this particular condition tied to it where you can only access their academic advising if you're either a current student or future student, essentially. That's to start out with. Um, to come down here, we have a graph of interconnected things. So we've got a credential that that uh, university offers. That credential requires this set of conditions here, which includes this target learning opportunity and this target learning opportunity. We'll go into those in a second. This one, this learning opportunity here, is part of this course, or sorry, it's part of this learning program, which is also offered by this, uh, this college. And you'll notice that each one of these has its own support services tied to it. So if we come up here and we look at the one that's tied to the learning program, there are a number of accommodations and services tied to that particular learning program. Those are offered by, in this case, a different organization from the one that offers the program. So the purpose of this is to show that uh, we can accommodate that situation as well. Um, of course, if this institution offered these services, then instead of this offer by arrow coming from here to here, you would have an offer by arrow connecting this service back to this organization. But for the purpose of this example, we have a, a sort of third party organization offering these services for this program. Similarly, uh, we have this course, which has a different set of support services tied to it, offered by the same institution, but this set of uh, support services has a set of conditions tied to it in that it's only available to this particular audience with this particular residency here. Coming back over here, we see that this credential requires another course, which happens to also be offered by this institution. This other course has a support service tied directly to it, but it's only available at their main campus. So all of these services tied to this support service profile are available at the main campus. Uh, this, this course has a particular offering uh, weekdays in the daytime and that particular offering of the course, independent of any other offerings of that course, that particular offering of the course via the scheduled offering class has a support service tied to it, which in this case is childcare, which is also offered by this institution up here. So zooming back out, uh, the, again, the purpose of this is to show that kind of no matter what your, your support services look like, you can describe them in very high, high general terms or very specific low level granular terms and kind of anything in between. You can also attach them to whatever entity in the model uh, is most relevant to that service. Uh, any questions on any of this? I didn't see any questions, Nate, but you did get a compliment. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And I believe Phil is up next. So I'm going to turn off the screen share here and you can take over. Okay, one second. And I hope you are seeing my screen now. Yep. Um, so looking back at um, the domain model that Nate um, showed you earlier, uh, as Nate said, things in blue are new, the things in orange are modified. And I'm going to take you through um, some of those modifications and proposed new uh, classes, properties, concepts, and concept schemes. Uh, we have the one new class. Uh, we have quite a few new properties, as you see. Um, we have two new concept schemes, and we have a, a truly impressive number of um, new concepts in those concept schemes. Um, Nate was especially pleased with the, the number of new concepts that we came up for him to type into the um, the management system that we use. It was, it was very fun. Yes. Thank you for that. <laughs> so what you'll see for all of these is that um, where we have a, a cell in a table in blue, it's something that is new or changed. Um, we have the one new class. 
um, that's the class of the, that describes things that are support services. We have a definition for that class, which is resources and assistance that help people overcome barriers to succeed in their education and career goals. And one of the things that we've tried to do all the way through these definitions, and um, if you get the chance to read the definitions and check on them, um, please let us know if we've um, strayed from this anywhere. We've tried to emphasize that um, support services cover the whole of the learning to earning um, journey that people can take. So we've tried not to talk about students because some of the people who use su support services will be in a job. Uh, we've tried not to be specific to things like learning opportunities or courses, because again, some of these will relate to people who are in occupations or won't be support services that are available for starting a particular occupation um, or maybe moving from an occupation into further education. So please check as we go along that we are not assuming um, that the person who needs the support service is a student, for example, or any other way that we might slip from this aim. So that's the one new class that we have. Um, we're fairly confident that that's an important class and that we, we've got it right, but it's not too late to tell us if we have made an error. Properties. We, we have quite a few more properties that we have either coined anew or have modified. And I'm going to take you through um, a table of the proposed properties. Um, and in that table, you'll see that we have um, several columns, um, numbered A th or lettered A through to I. The ones that are important to look at are the, the label, the definition, the comment, the usage note, because those are the ones that um, you will be seeing as a non-technical user. Uh, if you have technical knowledge, then by all means, um, check out that the URIs make sense or that the domain or the, sorry, the range makes sense. Um, but in general, um, make sure that the, the definition um, is appropriate. Um, the comment does actually provide clarification where it's needed. Um, likewise, the um, usage notes should provide clarification. Uh, and if you come across anything um, where, for example, the definition really doesn't chime with the label, um, please do let us know. So I'm going to show you the um, proposals document now. Um, and this is the CTDL, this is the properties part of the proposal document. Reminder, the cells that are in blue um, are changes. And where you see an entire row that's in blue, then that's something that's completely new. What the first row is telling you is that we have this new property, um, which has the label has support service. Um, and it can be used to describe things that are of the type that's listed under class. So has support service can be used to describe assessment profiles, collections, courses, credentials, jobs, learning opportunity profiles, learning programs, and so on. Um, this is just writing out in text in tabular form what Nate showed you earlier in the domain model. The other new properties that we have are accommodation type, which is the type of modification that is made to facilitate equal access to people, uh, for people to a physical location, resource or service. So that's accommodation in the sense of reasonable accommodation, if you're aware uh, of that as a phrase that comes up in um, uh, legal descriptions of what organizations are obliged to do um, in order to provide equitable access. And the other new, completely new properties are down at the bottom. Um, support service condition that is the requirements that must be fulfilled in order to qualify for a support service. Um, support service for, this is the um, reverse of um, has for support service. Um, it's that property that Nate mentioned earlier that allows you, if you're providing a support service, to say what 
precisely it is the um, what, which resources it is the support service for and support service type um, not surprisingly that lets you know the that lets you specify the type of support service that is being offered so those are the four new properties um, please take a look at them please um, make sure that the uh, the definitions meet the label uh, the, the definitions correspond to your understanding of the label or at least don't aren't dissonant with it um, and make sure that you you understand the definition um, if it needs clarification through a comment or a usage note we can easily add that the other changes many of them are existing terms that have been modified so that they can be used with support service uh, and those are fairly um trivial trivial perhaps gives the wrong idea they're, they're important but they're simple changes um what you'll see quite often on um the properties that already existed but have been added to support service is that the definition has been changed and what's happened here is that the existing definition will mention the type of resource that the property is used on so this one uh would perhaps say that it's a listing of online and or physical locations of a learning opportunity um, we want to apply that to support services now so we need to make the the small change to the definition uh, in order to uh, make it clear that it's not limited just to learning opportunities now it can be used with other types of resource um, if you're interested in what these changes are each property that exists is linked to its current listing in the um, ctdl terms um, page on the technical website so if you want to check through this um, a useful thing for you to do would be to think of how you'd describe a support service that you know of and check that all of the properties that you would need to describe that support service are there and that you understand what what they mean and how to use them going back to the things that we've changed uh well concept schemes there um as Nate said we use concept schemes to arrange the um, controlled vocabularies that we use to provide values for um, the predicates in statements the um, the properties when they're used in a statement um, can have values that come from a, con the, a controlled vocabulary uh, which is the concept scheme we have added terms to existing concept schemes largely to um, extend their suitability um, where they were limited in so, some way that didn't meet the requirements of support services and normally that was to include non-education settings um, but we've also added two new concept schemes and these are associated with the two two of the new properties that I mentioned earlier um, one is the types of accommodation that can be used for the um, accommodation type property um, sorry support yeah accommodation type property um, and the other is the support service category uh, concept scheme which can be used to provide values for the support service type property um, hopefully though the definitions and the con comments are clear enough uh, the accommodation are types of features changes or modifications or adjustments made to a facility service or resource to provide equal access and opportunity to people with diverse needs and preferences and there is a comment on that um, to explain what we mean by an accommodation um, you know, physical features or modifications to the environment alternative formats or modes of communication flexible scheduling personal assistance services among others um, the support service category is a, a simpler idea it's just a way of categorizing the types of support service that might be offered so again there are very many concepts um, that have been added I am not going to go through them all 
um, as with the properties, the things that are worth looking at and making sure that they make sense are the label, the definition, the comment and the usage note. And I can show you um, how these are arranged in the proposal. OK, so here are the new concept schemes and here are the concepts. We start with um, concepts that have been added to existing concept schemes. Um, the one that we added most to was audience. Uh, and this is part of making sure that we're not limiting ourselves just to um, just to students, just to learners, but also adding audiences that reflect the, um, the the demographics that support services might be um, trying to assist. So, you know, a new way of um, a, a new value for the audience concept scheme of um, currently incarcerated or formerly incarcerated people um, allows you to say that a support service is intended to help such people. And that's essentially the intention behind all of the new properties in the audience scheme. Take a look at them. Let us know if we think anything is if you think anything is missing. If you do that, make sure that it doesn't already exist um, in the audience concept scheme, because quite a few of the obvious ones do. Um, we added new terms to two or three other concept schemes um, because they turned out to be things that were important for, um, uh, for, for ensuring equity, equal access, um, which weren't already covered. Um, they don't relate necessarily to new properties that we're adding, but um, for example, it turned out to be important to know whether um, something was delivered at uh, what we decided to call variable site. It's not um, tied to one specific site. That can be useful for um, providing e equitable access to people who perhaps can't move themselves. Um, likewise, we added a new type of financial assistance of stipend, um, new learning method of cohort-based. Um, and then we get on to the... Um, the, the two new concept schemes, the, the big ones. The first one is for accommodation. Um, these are the features, modifications, adjustments that are made to um, uh, physical spaces or to um, resources. And we have divided the accommodation concept scheme into two branches. Um, the first branch deals with facility accommodations. These relate to um, modifications and adjustments made to physical space or facility. And the second one comes further down. You'll see um, when facility accommodation changes to resource and service accommodation here. Uh, these are this second grouping relates to accommodations that are designed to provide equal access to resources and services, but not physical facilities. We have um, drawn on existing vocabularies where we could find them, existing concepts where we can find them. Um, we've drawn a lot on the expertise of the, um, the working group um, to try and cover all of the types um, of accommodations that might be relevant. Um, we've done quite a lot of work to make sure that these are coherent, to try and avoid overlapping um, concepts where possible, where it would be unclear uh, which one you should use. Um, and we still invite comments and um, clarification or requests for clarification on the terms, on the concepts that we have described here. And I'm not going to read through them all because there really are too many to cover. The second proposed concept scheme uh, is for the type of support service that's offered. Again, we've drawn on existing vocabularies. One of the vocabularies that we drew most heavily on uh, is SEDS, um, Common Education Data Schema. And often in the comment 
you'll see a, a kind of cryptic note, Skoll's narrow match, and then a, a, a number with a, a that's linked. And this is a link to the term from SEDS that we have used uh, largely as inspiration or, uh, you know, that we've drawn on in order to come up with this category of support service. Uh, if you were to follow this link, you would go to the SEDS definition of that um, that type of that category of support service. Uh, and you'll see that what we've done mostly is we've reduced the length of the definition. Um, hopefully it's still clear, but we haven't gone into the, the precise enumerations that, that SEDS sometimes does. The other thing that we've done again is we have changed the definition slightly because SEDS is always talking about um, students or learners, and we don't want to be limited to that. Um, again, a long list of different types of support service that can be um, categorized. Uh, we invite you to look through them. If you know of a support service, make sure you can find a type for it that, that would fit in here. Um, if not, or if it's not clear which one it would be, um, let us know. The final thing that I want to mention is about these definitions. As I've said, we've drawn wherever we can on existing definitions, existing best practice. Um, but we want to make sure that we are inclusive in these definitions, that we we don't label people in any inappropriate way, um, that we don't stigmatize groups that um, you know these support services are, are trying to help in any way. So we'd welcome um, uh, everybody to look through. And if you find that we've written anything that is poorly phrased, that might be misinterpreted in a way that would be hurtful or harmful to anybody, then please let us know before we publish this. So back to the presentation. Um, the proposal document that I've been showing you is uh, there's a link included in this presentation that will be circulated to you after the call. Um, and the other place that you might want to look at these definitions is in the, the pending section of the terms definition page that we have. And there's a link to that um, on this slide as well. And I think Cadence will be popping it into the chat uh, momentarily. Um, most, nearly all of the properties that are currently pending come from this proposal. Um, you might, or th there are one or two that um, are small changes that just happen to be going through um, the, the minor change process at the moment. Um, so please don't get distracted by those. Um, so please, that, that's an invitation um, to all of you to check our work and let us know if we've done anything that's um, uh, unclear or could be improved in any way. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> Not seeing any questions in the chat, please. Um, we encourage questions. Um, so if you have any, please go ahead and raise your hand or put them in the chat. We're more than happy to um, answer your questions. So in addition to the terms proposal, um, what we do in tandem is develop what would be a um, pending <clears throat> um, minimum data policy for the credential registry. The development of CTDL terms is completely separate from the credential registry. As we already established, of course, the credential registry is only utilizes CTDL data. Um, so we found over the over um, you know doing these these task groups we found over time that it is far more efficient to include this in the process now. So what we have done is we've gone through the new support services class properties or terms and um, aligned them to uh, the credential registry minimum data policy. That policy consists of three kinds of levels, I suppose. The first is required, and that means that any terms that are deemed to be required, when you publish to the registry, that data would have to be included or um, our, our tools would not allow the data to be published. Um, the next level is recommended benchmarks, and those are best practices to add additional information that adds additional value 
um, to the data. And then finally, optional. So required, recommended, and optional are all data that can be published to the registry, but required is the minimum data policy. So in the terms proposal that Phil was going over, you will see a column where we identify one of those three categories. Um, but we thought it would be a lot easier for you to also see it on one slide because that is a multi-page document. So here you can see um, in section the first section, one through F are would be the minimum data requirements for publishing to the registry. And again, keeping in mind that anyone can use the CTDL and in your own environments, you could decide what, you know, which properties or terms to use, but for the credential registry, this is what we're saying would be the minimum data. And then below that, you can see what we're saying would be the recommended benchmarks. And um, two of those properties that are highlighted in blue are the new um, terms um, <clears throat> that, <clears throat> um, you know, we would recommend including with the, with the benchmark data. So you can also, while you're reviewing the proposal, if you're interested, you could also take a minimum a look at the minimum data policy proposal and provide any feedback on that as well. So <clears throat> um, how to provide feedback. Um, following this webinar, there is a two-week feedback period that ends on June 2nd, 2023. Um, we invite you to use any of the three uh, options to um, let us know of your feedback. And the first option is to directly in the terms proposal that Phil was screen sharing, you can um, use commenting. Um, and the second option is using our GitHub repository. If we have any um, techie folks in here that um, have a GitHub account, this may be your preference. Um, and remember, you can use any of those three. If, if the second one isn't for you, no worries. You do not have to use that option. And then thirdly, um, you can send an email. We do monitor this count every business day. So any emails that come in with feedback will get forwarded to me. And um, we will take a look at, the, at that feedback. So all three of these are great ways to provide feedback. Um, take advantage of them, please, ahead of June uh, 2nd, 2023. And while um, external folks are taking a look at that proposal and providing feedback, in the background, we're going to be working on getting things ready to implement the update. So no worries if you provide feedback and we um, need to make a change, we will make those changes. Um, but we'll be working on things like updates to the CTDL handbook, as I already pointed out, the minim minimum data policy, the credential registry publishing API is updated, as well as the API guide. There'll be an interface update to the credential registry publishing system to be able to bulk upload support services. And the credential finder will be updated, of course, to be able to see the data published to the registries that have support services. And then finally, um, all the consuming options from the credential registry include being able to you know, consume support service data along with the other data in the registry. So we'll be busy working on all of these while you're working on getting us feedback. <clears throat> and I wanna mention another opportunity to get involved. Um, we're going to be um, implementing another task group. If after hearing about the process and after hearing about um, the outcomes from uh, the support services task group, if you're interested, we're going to be forming a rubrics task group and we'll drop a link in the chat. Um, so if you're interested in joining, you can go ahead and join that task group. The schedule for that task group is included on the page um, about it where you can register to join. So it's really important for our processes to get as much input as possible. And we welcome um, subject matter experts, you know, across uh, across the realm of, you know, relevant, um, <clears throat> uh, whether you're technical or non-technical, and you do not have to uh, know the CDDL either to be a task group member. <clears throat> 
Um, <clears throat> of course, we'll be sending a follow-up email. It will include a link to the recording. It'll uh, include a link to all the materials that were shared. And you can see this slide has a listing of all the resources that are relevant to the support services proposal that we just went over in this webinar. And do we have any questions? Would anybody like to raise your hand or put questions in the chat? I haven't seen any questions, Jeannie, but I know you'll be interested in Robert's comment, which is that he's been um, getting chat, chat GPT to format support services according to the minimum data policy. Ah, <laughs> well, that's exciting. <laughs> that's good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Fantastic. Well, if there aren't any questions, um, <clears throat> then we can go ahead and conclude this webinar. Again, I want to thank all of you who participated this afternoon, and I want to extend my thanks again to the Support Services Task Group, whose participation was you know, critical to being able to get to this proposal that we were able to deliver you to, to deliver to you today um, for your additional feedback. So get us your feedback by June um, 2nd, and we hope to see you in an upcoming task group. Have a great rest of your day.